our scripture reading. We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 12 and verse 36. Matthew 12, verse 36. verse that makes us contemplate the words that we speak. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. If you can be praying for Brother Rob as he shares and that each of our hearts can be touched with what God would have us here this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to say greetings to our online audience who's going to be gathering with us today on this Sabbath. And you know, it's a new year. It gives us a chance to pause and to think about maybe things that we want to change, to reflect on the things that have happened, the accomplishments that we've made, and maybe what we can do different to be more effective as God's ambassadors. Would you please bow your head with me as we open up this topic today? Father in heaven, Lord, I'm just praying that you would help me with the words that I speak. I pray that it would be a savor of life unto life, that I would be able to be used by you to edify, and that we'd be, by, be blessed by being here together today, and that we would exalt you, Jesus, as our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> So the power of words, have you thought about it? The power that is in the words that you speak on a daily basis are making impacts that are going to last throughout all eternity. And so I'm one of those that I think if I had to judge myself, I think I speak too much and I, I think I need to pay more attention to the words that I speak. So this is just as much a sermon to me as it is to you, and hoping that as we go forth from this place today, we'll choose our words and we'll think about what we say. Now in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, 1 to 5, is talking about the 144,000. It's a special group of people. They've got their father's name written in their foreheads. Verse 4, they are they which not defiled with women, they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And then verse 5 is what I want to focus our attention on. It says, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So this is a group of people who do not have any guile in their mouth. Speaking of a pure group of people. Also in 1 Peter chapter 3.10 it says, For he who would love life and see good days, what is he supposed to do? Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. I believe a lot of these passages that we're going to read today have a promise packed within them that if we follow the guidelines of the Bible and the scriptures, it truly is true. Now, you probably haven't read this lately, but there are seven things the Lord hates that are an abomination. It's about the strongest language I think God could communicate to us. And three of those seven things that the Lord hates has to do with what comes out of our mouths. A lying tongue, a false witness, one who sows discord among the brethren. So if it's three of the seven, maybe we should take a little time this morning to talk about it. The importance and the power of the words that you and I use on a daily basis. So the first impact that I want to talk about today is how our words affect others. Now, 
there in Proverbs chapter 12, it says, There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. I really believe that what we say not only affects others, but it affects us. We can help people with their health by the words that we use. You know, sometimes we think it's fable and kind of not true or myth that people talk to their plants. Have you ever heard that? I think there's some wisdom to that. Pleasant words in Proverbs chapter 16 are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Are we living in a world that is in need of pleasant words? We go through life on a daily basis and are barraged on all points of you're not good enough, you're not going to make it, other people got more than you, you're never going to be good enough, whatever those words that come in upon us, often those good words are crowded out and we start to have self-image problems because we don't think we measure up. I'm sure that son would love to hear from his father. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. I love you. It's so sad to me that somebody could go through their whole life and not hear that. And that would solve so many problems. Words. The power of words. It promotes healing and health. Now there's some other verses in the Bible and we could spend the entire time looking at how words affect us. And especially... The scripture words. In Psalm 45, it talks about grace being poured into a person's lips. Or Isaiah, speaking a word in season to him who is weary. We might not know someone who is weary. We might not know that the words that we speak may turn that person at that critical moment, they were on their way to, say, commit suicide. We bumped into them. We've been praying for divine appointments. And did we give a good word to him who is weary? Let our speech in Colossians be seasoned with grace. We shouldn't let any corrupt communication proceed of our, of our mouths because we've been with Jesus. And Jesus is transforming us to be the salt and light of the earth. And how we communicate that is through the voices that God has given us. We want to have sound speech that cannot be condemned above reproach. Oftentimes I hear Christians use words that too much border on the world. And its language betrays our Christian heritage. Now you remember the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Why am I bringing this story up today? Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage to the promised land, and things aren't just happening as quickly as they'd like, and these men start complaining and sowing that discord among the brethren that Moses doesn't know what he's doing, and if they follow these guys, they'll bring him straight into the promised land. A lot quicker than Moses is going to get it done. It's interesting to note that that spread, and it spread some more, and it spread till we have many thousands of people dying because of that discord and that sowing of those that... God's appointed leader didn't know what he was doing. And so we have to be careful that we talk about who God has put in place as leaders. The earth swallowed up these men for their rebellion. It started in heaven with Lucifer. You remember that rebellion that's continued to move out until a third of the angels rebelled. So what we say 
has tremendous effect on others. Another wonderful proverb about the power of words today, brothers and sisters, the impact it has on people. It says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. What are your words? What are my words producing in the world around us? Now, in James chapter 3, 5 verse through verse 7, it talks about the power that's within the tongue. It says, even so the tongue is a little member. It's this little piece of the body, and it says, and it boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell for every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea. They are tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I'm sure most of us here have said things we wished we'd have, ah, I wish I hadn't said that. Maybe we've said things out loud about ourselves. I can't believe I'm such an idiot that did that. Those words have an impact. And today we're going to unpack that. So the second impact of our words, they reveal the condition of our heart. Where is our heart? So if our hearts are bitter, guess what else is going to be bitter? Our words. If your heart is right with the Lord, your words are going to track behind that. Remember the scripture that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your words really are revealing the condition of your heart. Back to our memory verse, talking about every idle word we should give an account. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart, brings forth what kind of things? Good things. Wholesome things. Productive things. But out of an evil heart treasure, he brings forth evil things. It's kind of the, you might look at it this way, what kind of seeds are you sowing? Think that your words are seeds that produce a crop. Are my words encouraging or are they critical? Are my words Edifying or shaming? This new year, I hope and pray with your prayers as well that I can love people and not judge people. That I can edify and encourage people. Come along beside them and pray with them. Lord, help us The third impact is the one I'm going to spend the most time today with you, is the impact our words have on each of us. The words that I speak, how do they affect me? The words that you speak, how do they affect you? Satan, by our words and expressions of feelings, he knows what we struggle with. And the temptations of our hearts, so when we give utterance to those internal struggles we have, he knows how he can better craft his temptation. So I don't want to give the devil any angle on me, so the less I complain about my problems, it makes the devil's job a little harder to craft his temptations. It goes on to say in the historical sketches, I like it how it says, it says, let us here resolve that we will not sin against God with our lips. That we will never speak in a light and trifling manner, that we never murmur or complain in the providence of God. And that we will not become accusers of the brethren. We can all always hinder the thoughts that come as temptations, but we can resist the enemy 
so that we shall not do what? So we won't utter those. The adversary of souls is not permitted to read the thoughts of men, but he's a keen observer, and he marks the words and actions and skillfully adapts his temptations accordingly. If all would labor to repress sinful thoughts and feelings, giving them no expression in words or acts, Satan would be defeated, for he would not know how to prepare his specious temptations to meet their cases. So the next time you're tempted to complain, to utter those things that get under your collar or your skin, I'm going to say that you say a short prayer. Lord, help me not to utter those things. Help me not to murmur, to complain. Help me to praise you in those difficulties. Now, the main focus of this talk this morning with you nice people is how our words affect our own character. Now, you have heard it before, and I believe it too, that our character is made up of thoughts and feelings. Well, where do thoughts and feelings come from? A lot of it comes from words. Every careless or idle word that we speak, we're going to have to meet again. One of my favorite books, Desire of Ages, says it this way, but the words are more than an indication of character. They have power to react on the character. Men are influenced, and women, men and women are influenced by their, what kind of words? Their own words. Often under a momentary impulse prompted by Satan, they give utterance to jealousy or evil surmising, expressing that which they do not really believe. But the expression reacts on the thoughts. They are deceived by the words and come to believe they are true, which was spoken at Satan's instigation. Having once expressed an opinion or decision are often too proud to retract it and trying to prove themselves in the right until they come to believe that they are. It is dangerous, brothers and sisters, to utter words of doubt, to, to speak it, to speak words of doubt. Dangerous to question and criticize divine light. If you go back to chapter 12 of Matthew, those religious leaders were questioning whether Jesus was the Messiah and they were committing the unpardonable sin, saying that the works of Jesus were done by Beelzebub. And Jesus warned them in that passage that sins will be forgiven, but those who take God's word and try to say that it was the devil who was doing that when it was Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be good. The habit of careless and irreverent criticism reacts upon the character. In fostering irreverence and unbelief, many a man indulging this habit has gone on unconscious of danger until he was ready to criticize and reject the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, every idle word men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words they shall be justified, and by thy word shall they be condemned. So I'm not here today to try to micromanage your words. What I'm trying to accomplish today in this short sermon is to help you realize the power that we have within ourselves in what we say to people is either going to be building and edifying and encouraging or dropping them off the radar screen into those areas the devil likes them to be without hope. Now, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but if you've ever been in a place in a canyon or a cliff or looking over the Grand Canyon, you say, hello, 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 hello. It's called an echo. And when you speak, it's as if your words talk back to you. You might be unconscious of it, but it's happening. Your words, what you speak, is affecting yourself as much as it's affecting others. And it says uttering lies makes us greater, what is that word? Greater liars. Words not only express convictions, but they also strengthen or weaken conviction. 
Words react upon our thoughts and feelings and our beliefs. Be careful what you say. Maybe we're on our way home from church and the kids are in the back seat and mom and dad are discussing how they really are picking apart the sermon the preacher just preached. The kids are getting a message in the back seat that they don't believe that this was God's word or they wouldn't be criticizing it so much. We have to be careful how we say things and how we view what is said. Our words. They speak back to us for good or for woe. Now, <laughs> when you think of words and the power they have, think of the bitter words that you speak. In other words, if this echo effect is real, then if I'm speaking bitter words, it's going to naturally make me more bitter. It's just a fact. Or if you speak words of doubt, you'll become a greater doubter. If you speak words of criticism, be a bitter, you'll become more of a critic. What if you speak words of hope? You'll be more hopeful. So it's what we say, what's in our hearts, we have to start right there and hopefully with God's grace, with us allowing Him to transform us. We can be those people that God called us to be, to represent His character correctly to those around us. Now this little slide about smoking was interesting to me because I've held quit smoking seminars and people try and they didn't, some are able to make it and some don't, but they, after all the different types of quit smoking programs, they said the one that worked the best was the one that they had the people verbally say, I choose to quit smoking. Now that makes sense because if they're saying it and it's echoing back, it's helping their willpower to say, yeah, I can do this with God's help, of course. When we speak, it makes a difference. Ministry of Healing, page 251, says, Nothing tends more to promote health of body and soul to the, uh, th than does the spirit of gratitude and praise. I'm going to read it again. Nothing tends more to promote health. Do we live in an age of COVID-19 and being sick and under the weather and all these other kind of things? Well, here's a little medicine. Here's a little prescription. Nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. Throw back the, stash, the sash over the window. Praise the Lord a new day. God bless that I can get up and I can see and and taste my good breakfast, and I've got fresh water, and a, and a beautiful wife, and on and on, we can just continue that, and all that is going to make us such wonderful people to be around. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much as a duty to pray. Now, I'm not saying that we can just every day be robots, there's going to come some challenging times where we aren't really in the mood. Or maybe we're depressed. But let's go ahead and speak what we know will help us through that. That God is good. That He loves me. He's got a plan for my life and a purpose. Amen? Amen. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining along the way to the Father's house? It takes time, brothers and sisters, but I believe that God can do it if we let Him. While words express thoughts, it is true that thoughts follow words. If we would give more expressions to our faith, more expressions to our faith. That's called singing on the way to church when you got time. We're all sitting in the car. We're driving down the road. And we've got 15 minutes. How about faith?
is the victory? How about leaning on the everlasting arms? How about we sing all those beautiful hymns and memorize them? Because one of these days, we might not have a hymn to sing. We should have more faith and greater joy. Now, Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I believe that literally. I really believe when it says that, a merry heart is like medicine. I really believe that a bitter, critical heart, heart is bad for my health physically. So the next time you want to encourage someone who's not got their health or maybe they're down or the immune system or they have the COVID, I want you to encourage them with good words. Speak to truth to them that God loves them. That he has a plan for their life. Whatever you know that they probably need as you know them. It's in the power of the tongue whether we give a blessing or we leave people by the side of the road to fight for themselves. Now, I think that we should praise God more through our trials. It's easy to praise God when the bills are paid. It's easy to do things that are easy. But let's say they cut the power off to your house. Let's say you got the COVID virus. Let's say, oh, a matter of things that could happen to us. You lost your job. Somebody doesn't understand what you said, took it wrong. You lost a loved one. Whatever happens to in this life, things are going to happen to us. What are we tempted to do? Uh, right? We're tempted to give in to that. Instead of that, we should say, wait a second, hold on, time out. This is happening. God still loves me. I'm going to praise my way through this thing. I'm going to do it God's way. So next time you're in danger, you're going to start singing this song, Under His Wings. And hopefully you sing it better than I do because I'm not a singer. <laughs> Under His Wings. Our Here's another one. You think you have no friends? What a friend we have in Jesus. These songs are miniature sermons to encourage us. You go along. Are you sad? There is sunshine in my soul today. Miniature sermons to encourage us. No direction in your life? Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Remember that song? You don't feel like praying? I've been there. You don't feel like praying. Well, I can sing a song that says, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour of Prayer. You remember the songs. You tired of this world? Face to face with Christ my Savior. Are you downhearted? Just when I need Him most. Jesus is there to comfort and cheer. Just when I need Him most. Now, granted, I think I sing best when I'm by myself. <laughs> I want to encourage people, right? And if I'm encouraged, there's other ways to encourage than me singing and them hearing going, ugh. <laughs> Martin Luther, we just had the 500th anniversary of good old Martin Luther. Now, today they tell us the protest is over. Well, I'm still protesting. It may be over for some. But what's interesting about Martin Luther, he spearheads this great Protestant Reformation. And what's interesting about him is one of the great weapons that Martin Luther used was the hymns that he wrote. We often know of him of nailing 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg, but we really haven't talked too much about this hymns that he sang or wrote. Now, I love this old song, A Mighty Fortress. You guys like that song? Old, classical. I could just wish I could hear it in Martin Luther's day with those big churches and those big organs and those big domes of this swelling into this beautiful 
song, a mighty fortress. I notice it says in verse 3, it says, Though this world with devils filled, God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little, what's that say? One little word is going to topple the devil. I love the way Jesus met the devil. Jesus didn't argue with the devil. Jesus didn't let the devil twist him up into knots. Jesus just said, it is written. Again and again, it is written. And the devil's on his heels. I have, no, I have no answer for that. I guess I'll go try to do something else. It is written. Jesus was a master at understanding the power of words. A Catholic priest once said, Martin Luther has done more harm to us with his hymns than when in his sermons. Because hymns are miniature sermons set to music that we can memorize. It's easy to do. My wife and I, we've memorized a song called Faith is the Victory. I say we've memorized it. She's memorized it. I know most of it. But we sing it on the way to church. It encourages us. It gives us encouragement for others. Now, I like this story of Paul and Silas. They're doing God's work. They're bringing the blessings to this little town and Paul and Silas are preaching the truth and it isn't long when you're preaching the truth that you get into trouble. And they get put in the stocks and it hurts and they've been beat and whipped and all those ugly things that go with that and I could see them doing this. Yep, that's what happens when you follow God. Might as well just get used to it. Yeah, it's a hard old road following Jesus. Maybe we should give it up. Now, that's not what happened. They started to do something. Anybody have an idea what they started to do? Yeah! You imagine that? What an idea! Let's start singing, Brother Paul. And they started singing. I don't know what song they sang, but it had that echo effect. So we're going to look at three things that happened, three results of Paul and Silas in what they were doing in that position, which, man, all intents and purposes, I could see anybody complaining under those circumstances. I haven't had dinner. I'm bleeding. I mean, we could make a long list of all the things that were going. They didn't focus on that. They were focusing on, wow, Jesus, thank you for considering it us to suffer as you did. Praise the Lord. And they started singing. And the first thing that happened, it strengthened their own faith. As they sang, I'll bet it got a little louder. And a little louder. We don't have it so bad. God is with us. What do we have to fear? We're in this position, but God has not forsaken us. Singing these beautiful hymns. And it isn't long before something else starts happening. The next thing happens is Satan is miserably defeated in this thing that he was trying to accomplish to shut these guys up and the third thing that happened the jailer and his house were converted not only did the word speak back to them and increase their faith it helped the jailer and his family be converted you see why it's so important for us not to get discouraged not to throw in the towel to murmur and complain is to do it the devil's way to praise God and count our blessings is God's way In the book, Education, page 166, I thought this was interesting. I was studying about this words and how does it work within our church and in the world. And With a song, Jesus in his earthly life met temptation often when sharp, stinging words were spoken. What was that first three words? With a what? With a song. Had you ever thought of Jesus singing? With a song... It says, often when the atmosphere about him was heavy with gloom and dissatisfaction, distrust or oppressive fear was heard his song of faith and holy cheer. Are we supposed to walk like Jesus walked? We're supposed to follow Jesus' example and sing when things aren't going our way. When it looks tough, it's going to get tougher, brothers and sisters. It's going to get darker. I, I hope 2021 is better. 
But at the same time, in my mind, it could be worse. We have to prepare for that. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. When's the last time you praised God? For anything. Hopefully we do it ongoing. Maybe when we gather for, with friends and family on holidays, I like to go around the circle and say, what are you personally thankful for? I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my children. They still are in the faith. I'm thankful that I live in a country where we have freedom. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm praise the Lord. I'm speaking that. We're speaking that. We're hearing that. We get to walk out of there going, praise the Lord. I'm encouraged. Now, in closing... I like this story because it helps with our point today. This gentleman that we're talking about is a professional baseball catcher. And he gets the privilege of going to the prison to talk to the guys, to encourage them, to tell them what makes success, what, how did he start from his early childhood as a boy and grow up and become this famous baseball catcher. So he has this privilege to do that. And so he's talking to the guys. They're all listening to him. He's telling them about something very critical in this story. Probably the most critical piece to this story is he's telling these guys of all of his trophies and you know, accolades of being a professional baseball catcher is something that happened way back when he was a boy. And when he was a boy, his father said to him and spoke the word, Son, someday you're going to be a famous baseball player. He sowed that seed into his mind of his son. His son, he probably said it more than once. Son, I got high aims for your life. I can see you being the best at that position. Really? Really? He lived up to his father's expectations. And he became a famous baseball catcher. It's interesting in the story, for me, one of the inmates raised his hand. Do you have something to say, sir? Yes. You see... You've been talking to us all day about your success and what happened in your life and you didn't want to disappoint your dad. When I was a little boy, my dad said to me, you're going to end up in prison. And I didn't disappoint my dad. I'm sure you heard a pin drop. What would have been the life of that inmate had he had a father that said, I believe in you, son? Hmm. Christ Object Lessons is, has to be one of my favorite books, and it says every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own. An atmosphere, it may be charged, electrified, with the power of faith, courage, and hope, and sweet with a fragrance of love. Oh, don't you love to be around those people? Or it may be heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness, or poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin. By the atmosphere surrounding us, every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected. This is a responsibility from which we cannot free ourselves. Our, what's that word? Our words, our acts, our dress, our deportment, even the expression of the countenance has an influence. Upon the impression thus made, 
there hang results for good or evil, which no man can measure. Every impulse thus imparted is seed sown, which will produce its harvest. It's a link in the long chain of human events, extending we know not whither. If, by example, we aid others in the development of good principles, we give them power to do good. In their turn, they exert the same influence upon others, and they upon still others. Thus, by their unconscious influence, thousands may be blessed. This morning, we watched a very wonderful mission spotlight. This guy who's 60 years old and stutters and it goes to another country, look at the influence that person had. Is there any excuse that we can't have a good influence? That we can't make the same ripple effect in our communities? That we can't inject into it faith, courage, and hope? January 2nd, 2021, I am appealing to you as my brothers and sisters that you take the word of God, that you align yourselves with Jesus, that you just let his love wash over you, that you let that word transform you from selfishness and covetousness and whatever those things are in your life so that we can go home, so the world can be warned. The world is looking for Christians in living form, not just a billboard on a sign, but an actual reality, flesh and blood that's moving, that makes a difference in their lives. Have you ever heard that old statement? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I have always said this, and I'll say it again. Love is not love unless it's expressed. Love is not love unless it's expressed. It could be a hug. It could be an encouraging word. I'm proud of you, son. I missed you. That dinner was great. Do we sometimes forget that we don't have to say things like that? We humans are often self-centered and thinking about ourselves too much. I'm just appealing to you this morning to make 2021 a year that you sowed in the good seed of good words in every situation at the workplace. Somebody treats you wrong. It's all right. I'm going to pray for that person. My family doesn't understand me. It's all right. I'm going to use good words. I'm taking the high road this year. Is it easy? No. I know that self is still very much alive if you're easily offended. Something happens and you're ready to... Self is much alive and we have to die to self. We have to let God's word transform us. We're that final generations, brothers and sisters. I believe this with all of my heart that we're going to go through the most discouraging time in history up ahead coming to a city near you soon. We can't escape it. We can't I, go away from it. It's going to come to our house sooner or later. And how are we going to deal with that when they turn our power off? When they take that card away? When every earthly support is going to be cut off, guess what we're supposed to do? We're going to do like Paul and Silas. Praise God, we're on the edge of eternity. Help us to give a good influence to those around us. <clears throat> I think if there's any one thing I'd want to say to you in 2021 is keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. And He will give you the words to speak to one who is weary. And that's what they need so much, to be loved and accepted. And as we study with them, as we pray with them, you know what's going to happen? We don't have to tell them they should change this or get rid of that or don't stop doing that. We love them and the Holy Spirit convicts them. Amen. Right? 
Last one is Psalm 35, 28. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Brothers and sisters, let's stand and sing our last song together and praise God today. Wonderful Words of Life, 286. so much that we have a new year, a new place to start where we can impact everyone around us with words that edify, encourage, words with love and acceptance. May each of us find ourselves loving others the way you love us. Thank you so much for the word that you gave to us to teach us how we can be more like you. Bless each one that is here and those that are listening to my voice. I pray that we might all be saved in your kingdom and experience at last those beautiful words the way you always intended it to be. God bless us, Lord, with your blessing. Dismiss us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.